Time. Some say time is money. We say money is time. With it, you're free to spend your time as you wish, to pursue your passions, to chase your dreams. With Gravity, you can take back more of your time when you earn money with the Introducer program. Get a percentage of your referrals transactions fees paid in BSV daily. Hello and welcome to another episode of Crypto Time. Today is the third special in a row of the CoinGeek Roundup. It's been an exciting event to be a part of in terms of the uh, kind of covering of the event and what's been happening in terms of the movers and shakers. And it's always interesting to see what's happening within the BSV community. It's been quite an exciting time, I would say. Yeah, um, over all three other days, to be completely honest with you. And the last day, to me, it, it really tied in all the loose ends. So a lot of the companies got to talk about what they needed to talk about, not just that you had the amazing roundup at the end by George Gilder, Craig Wright, and then of course, Jimmy, which um, gave a very clean, clear and concise explanation of what Bitcoin is right at the end of the conference. Yeah, they really put their stamp back on the back on the scene again in terms of exactly what they're trying to achieve, exactly what they're doing with BSV and how it's going to all operate going forward. So I think really successful event overall. Um, we'll save uh, the Craig talk, uh, I think, pretty much to the end of our chat today because it's the, the juicy part. So obviously stay tuned in to watch that part, um, which is going to be interesting. So obviously going over, as I usually do, go into all the articles that have been popping out around um, the actual event itself, just seeing whether people took a slightly different stance to us or not. Um, CoinGeek came out with a great article in relation to this, um, and it really hit the nail on the head in terms of setting the actual tone of what was going on. Yes, of course, it was about one world chain. It was about one, you know, project for the future and ensuring that's the right path forward. But it was also about businesses and something that CoinGeek wrote here, which I felt was very kind of poignant about the event, was whether it's companies within the Bitcoin SV ecosystem joining forces or BSV entrepreneurs reaching out into the big world world, there's been a sense of business after developing their own enterprises and expertise, realizing that they can have more impact by working with partners to their mutual benefit. This has been something that has been, um, you know, real key around this event. Instead of people standing alone and saying, you know, I'm trying to do it, it's about joining forces, right? A stupid example, you know, in England years and years ago, we had many, many different armies. We had many, many different kings of England. What we decided that it was better to have one king of England and one army to fight forwards. And of course, we're not trying to say that every project is uniting, but it's great to see that people are uniting to have a stronger force and a stronger front forward, which I think has worked very well as a whole. Would you agree? Yeah, hundred percent. And if, if you just look at it in, in any real sense, to be fair, whenever you have a, a group of people that are cooperating effectively, it's always better than just a single individual. And everyone within the cryptocurrency space, they need to understand that they don't need to be complete experts in absolutely every field. You lean on other people, you lean on other companies and, and they're like professional fields comes back to that age old saying of you don't really want to be a jack of all trades, you want to be master of one. But if you can find that you're the master of one in one field and you find another master of one in another field and they marry together to work a project, for me, that that's only a plus side of things, really. So I think it kind of pushes forward in the right light. Um, you know, as we said, Jimmy, you know, um, as usual, kind of did an opening kind of uh, push out um, again, was talking about businesses working together, one world chain and the power of BSV. Um, nothing really changed there. But again, it was very inspirational. It was nice to see him kind of pushing the event out in the correct light. Um, we then moved on to what I found was the first kind of real grabbing kind of event there. Um, which was around uh, Jimmy moderator, uh, moderating sorry, and talking to Alex from Handcash. Um, that's always an exciting one to, uh, to you know, stay abreast with. Um, you know, the Handcash guys over time have really been doing a very, very good job uh, for the community and adding some really, really good and interesting points to the space. Um, so just to have uh, some of the points that they put there, Handcash Wallet has integrated the ability to transfer payments to a username as the wallet address rather than the long winded code and key that you would obviously have to put at the back of that. That's interesting to start with because we've, we've mentioned it many, many times that it's about taking the kind of sphere that we know today, which can be quite technically minded and making it more kind of palatable for the general users and individuals out there. And I think that's something that Handcash have done quite well. Yeah, definitely. And um, a lot of the developers within cryptocurrencies in the early days anyway, we're now starting to transition out of that. But it, it 
kind of got to the stage where you had developers over developing, making things over complicated, a lot more complicated than what they needed to be, because of course that's how their minds work. Yeah, I mean, me and you laugh about it, don't we? Yeah. I mean, we work with obviously developers. Uh -huh. In terms of mindset, I'm not trying to say they're any different to us as people, but in terms yeah. of mindset, they completely, uh, you know, change the way that they look at things. And obviously uh -huh. you have to put yourself in that kind yeah. of... Uh, I think if you could literally open up their brains, it's just schematics. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just numbers and, <laughs> and uh, algorithms and yeah. uh, things that are working through. No, no, it's a completely fair point. They really wrapped up uh, nicely with also now having uh, keyless sign up for a page, which is interesting. Uh, no need to remember sequences of codes to make sure you can retrieve your money. They use a threshold to signature scheme, which obviously just makes that system easier uh, for people to use. Um, did you want to say anything around threshold signatures? No, just in general, the whole thing yep. on all the development upgrades that they're basically implementing yep. at the moment, um, a lot of it, uh, it is UI. Um, I know it doesn't seem like they're very important upgrades or very important changes, but they are yeah. because these are the things that make it a lot more palatable for the end user. Yeah. And we need to make crypto as simple as possible. People shouldn't even know that they're really even using or experiencing it. Yep. Everything needs to be as easy and as seamless as possible. And that is actually uh, one thing that they were highlighting in the whole CoinGeek event was the importance of UI the fact that we actually need to really, really, really start focusing on that. <laughs> yeah, and tie that back to gravity, it's the same thing. You know, we've got some fantastic uh, UI and UX um, designers that work on obviously the platform that we're doing. And it's the same thing. We want to make this whole platform as easy and as kind of seamless for people to use as possible. And the way that you do that is by making it as simple as possible. And one of the things that always makes me laugh is the more simple it looks on the front page, the more difficult it can be on the back end of everything. Um, and I think that's just a real clear point to show that just because something looks simple on the, on the front page doesn't mean that huge amount of work hasn't gone into the back of it. And not only that, it's made the experience easier to use. I mean, we've seen it with cars, just as a stupid example, you know, uh, 15 years ago, when you went and bought one of the latest cars, there was literally hundreds of buttons down the inside. Now, if you go and purchase one of the latest cars, what you find is they dialed that down a lot um, in terms of the actual user experience and what you're seeing in front of you has become a lot more simpler and a lot more easier to use over time. Um, and it's just the same within this space, exactly the same kind of uh, format that's been pushing forward. We also had a conversation that was moderated by Jimmy uh, that was on cashless casinos, how Bitcoin technology can create a better and safer gaming experience. Some of the main points they put there was about loyalty, transparency, KYC, and going cashless, um, all things that are gonna make it you know, much easier for these people to use as a whole, which I think is good. Um, and that's something that's been confusing within the actual gaming space as a whole, um, is just trying yeah. to how, how it's gonna integrate. To be honest, a lot of the people within the crypto space will be able to identify like well not just identify be able to actually like compare with them all the problems that they're having in their space compared to the problems that we're having in our space yes. perfect example of this gambling companies find it very hard to, to maintain stable banking relationships mm -hmm. exactly the same thing with cryptocurrency companies like for us to get to the stage of where we are right now, where we have these stable relationships, it's taken a hell of amount of work. Yep. And to be honest with you, we had to actually focus on a lot of these areas that they're highlighting right here. Um, so for example, all of our AMO and KYC processes, mm -hmm. we have to be extremely stringent on all of them. Yep. And these are the things that have afforded us the relationship that we have with our banking partners. Yep. Um, so. The fact that the gambling industry is focusing on these areas is all areas that Bitcoin really can fix. And we've spoken about it on multiple times. Yeah, and I think it goes back to that whole uh, theme of the event side of things about having, you know, real world businesses and working them in, uh, in a normal light. So again, going back to that whole kind of previous view of what crypto was, was that you didn't really need KYC. You didn't need, um, you know, uh, anti-money laundering kind of precautions in place. Whereas, for example, a gambling company are going to have regulators that are hot on their heels to ensure that they're doing the job properly. So we have to, again, integrate this crypto world to the real world and ensure that it works properly. And that's something that just seems to work as you know a perfect fit in terms of what they're trying to achieve because it just makes it more clear more uh, you know more transparent more precise in terms of what people are trying to achieve and even the experience itself which we'll come on to in a minute because um, we've got another uh, talk around iGaming and obviously the future around blockchain technologies as well um, as to how you know we can see this you know picture developing and how it's going to work going forward mm -hmm. um, there's definitely some ways that are going to improve the user experience as a whole which I find interesting yes yeah. Going into obviously that talk that um, I just mentioned around iGaming and the future of blockchain and technology and what's going to happen, we had Alex Shaw from BitBoss mention around cashless casino. Now, 
One thing, for example, um, around the betting uh, sector that I found interesting is, say, for example, I want to uh, place a bet on the Premier League. I want to place it around the football side of things, right? Um, I may want to place that bet three days before the bet actually, you know, is about to take place or the game is about to take place. So now I've staked, say, that fifty pounds or ten pounds or whatever it is that I'm going to place on that bet for three days. Then not only that, if I do win my bet, I then have to wait maybe three days for me to receive those funds back into my bank account. Therefore, if I'm using that as a pot to actually gamble and to actually use as a business, for example, because there are a lot of professional gamblers out there, that slows my kind of uh, monetary flow down, which is not what you want. Cash is king. You want to always have that float so you can do what you want to do. Now, one of the things that obviously has been touted through you know these kind of systems is about having the ability to pay directly from your wallet and once the payment's been made it comes back directly to your wallet you haven't got this two or three days um, you know waiting by for obviously to receive those funds back now there are many reasons why gambling companies do that they don't just do it for the reason that you know it takes them two or three days they also do it for the fact that you know if it's sitting there for two days you can uh, revert the payment back into your account and then you can make that bet you may potentially have not made so they have reasons behind it but what i'm really interested in is about making this a fairer and safer space for people to gamble within so, for example, I don't want to, you know, be in a situation where I'm tempted to do something. You know, it should be a case where that decision is made, where the funds come back into my account and then I can make that decision to go back if I want to, rather than being held ransom with those funds being in that account, um, which I find interesting as a whole. Yeah. And um, to talk about that, Craig actually spoke about and, and very much highlighted timestamping yeah. within the Bitcoin blockchain. The fact that every single thing needs to be timestamped. And if it wasn't timestamped, then how the hell can you organize anything? I agree. Like timestamping is what also helps you and it is one key feature that allows you to organize the chaos within Bitcoin. Yep. Like if you're a gambling company, for example, you've got loads of inputs, outputs, you've got loads of people placing, like, for example, um, actual bets, etc. Now all of this stuff will need to be timestamped. And if it is timestamped, it makes it very easy for the company that's using it to do stuff like accounting, et cetera. Yep. Um, everything literally becomes like at, at a press of a button. So you can imagine how this affects those particular companies. Expenses get reduced massively. The fact that they have really bad banking partners means that they're paying like high transaction fees, which w it will also assist in that area. Yep. So. A lot of people are now looking at BSV especially because it is palatable for all of these different business models by the fact that it scales, meaning that we can also have cheap fees. Yep. And if we're having cheap fees, then all of these options become available to all of these different businesses. Yep. And when we look into the token economics of all of these different cryptocurrencies, yep. I know BSV is not cryptocurrency, yeah, yeah. but just for the sake of the listeners, yeah. all of these small little changes within the uh, actual token economics echoes out massive ripples. And if you are changing the foundation, those ripples are hitting all of these different companies, no matter how small that particular change is. Yep. You don't want to be sending out ripples. No. You want to allow these companies the calm waters to come in and set up the infrastructure that they need. No, I couldn't agree more. And I think this is something that we're seeing develop as the space becomes more rounded as well. I think something that was interesting there that you spoke about fees as well. Um, the fee side of things is one of the most interesting aspects of it because something that me and you've spoken about and we've spoken about through this three-day roundup is about incentivization towards people, right? What gets people doing what they need to be doing? Now, a lot of the stuff when it comes to the crypto world becomes very much kind of um, on the user side to be the benefit rather than, for example, the merchant, right? There's lots of ways that, for example, if you're, again, using that silly Netflix uh, example, instead of paying for a subscription that you might not use over a monthly period, let's pay by the second, right? That's more beneficial to the user than what it is, for example, for Netflix, because Netflix at the moment will be picking up that, say, $12.99, even if we don't watch the, watch the show. So it becomes more beneficial for the user. Same thing applies in many, many different areas within uh, you know, the, the, the business world. But at the same point, when it comes to the gambling side of things, it actually changes up quite a bit because they're getting charged huge amounts of their profit 
um, to by the banks to actually transact and to make all this stuff happen. So again, straight away, you can really see how iGaming and obviously the whole kind of casino based games and all the rest of it have a real space within the BSV world and within the crypto community as a whole, because actually it just improves the experience for both ends, which is something which is really encouraging to see. And I can see these kind of companies being the ones that really start gaining traction for the space at first, because it just 100% makes sense overall for everybody that's involved. And I think that's a nice, uh, a nice spot to uh, move on from the kind of gaming side of things. So moving on now to George Gilder, um, very, very interesting uh, gentleman. He's always been, you know, uh, a big fan of the BSV ecosystem. And he's also been a very good big advocate of Craig Wright as a whole, Enchain and what they're trying to do within the space. Um, and I think it's not just because, you know, there's friendships that have been formed that are good. Yeah. I think it's because he really sees the vision of what's supposed to be happening. Yeah. So um, George is obviously an economist, writer, um, investor and technology visionary. Um, so quite a uh, quite a title there for him, which is interesting um, to see. So just in terms of George and obviously Craig and the whole kind of conversations that went on, I know that we've got George and Craig as separate, obviously, um, talks to do, but I do think they kind of amalgamate to one a little bit because we had the chat where they were both involved. Um, what's your opinion on what was said around uh, George, Craig and all the rest of it? First of all, George, um, in terms of the presentations, I will go as far to say that is probably one of the best presentations for me. Sure. Um, just because it has a lot of the things that I'm actually properly, properly interested in since a, a young child and things that I've been looking into since that age. And for me, um, a lot of that, I, I, I knew my information was correct from just the research that I've put in. But watching that, he touched on literally a lot of the exact same things that here we talk about consistently, mm -hmm. which means that these are real issues that need to be fixed. And when these real issues are fixed, we, we start to venture into a completely better world. And what he really does uh, pinpoint is understanding what knowledge and wealth really, really is. Well, the, the real standards. knowledge is wealth. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the real standards of what is currency, what is money, what all these things intertwined. And, um, you know, again, I come from a gold background, you come from a gold background before being into the whole crypto space. Um, but as a whole, you know, you really start to understand the differences between what money is, what currency is, and he helps along that journey. And then um, me and you have always been humble enough that we always want to be, uh, you know, students. We always want to be learning more. We always want to be understanding more about the sector as a whole. And I think that people like George were a great starting point in terms of, um, you know, gaining more knowledge for us and just looking at things in a slightly different light. It's nothing that we haven't heard before. It's nothing that's completely groundbreaking. But at the same time, it's just recalibrating the way that you think and the way that you see and the way that you understand money, currency, and all the different yeah. moving intricate parts that, that make up those, those formats. Yeah, exactly. And the way he explains it is very clear and concise. Um, he starts explaining, for example, uh, why gold is really and truly the only measuring stick that we have to associate with time. Yep. Um, because Gold, of course, we've had it for 5,000 plus years. Yep. Um, in, in ancient civilizations, it was a very valuable thing. It always has been. Yep. Um, we, we know this from history. So in our modern day society on how we were actually using it, for example, like the Bretton Woods Agreement, when um, they basically duped the rest of the world yep. into backing, well, basically US dollar being the world reserve currency yep. and all of them pegging to the US dollar and then the US dollar pegging to gold. Yeah, very clever, yeah. very clever movement for them. That's for yeah, sure. chest. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so then after that, of course, we had President Nixon that came in and then completely abolished the gold standard, meaning that now you have all of these different currencies that are pegged to US dollar and the US dollar is pegged to no real form of measuring. Oh, hang on a minute, it's got its printer and it's got its ink and it's got its paper that's worth a hell of a lot. I mean, that, let's not let's not discount that, mate. Let's not. Was it HP? <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably. It's probably just one of them little ones that they hit on the smartphone. More dollars? Go. <laughs> <laughs> but, so why gold is a real measuring stick is because it's always taken a lot of effort to, of course, go in pull it out of the ground and then turn it into something that we want. Yeah, we can't make it out of fresh air. We have to actually invest into bringing it out of the ground and making, you know, some real investments to actually, you know, making that happen and having that finite uh, material within our hand. It's, yeah. it's not just some sort of thing that we can just go, yeah, okay, let's just have some more of that. It's just exactly. not, not and possible. Throughout history, that process has never really, really changed. We've added, yeah, machinery to it, but it's, it, it speeded up the process a little bit, but nothing major. Yeah. So it still takes a lot of output 
to, to get something out of it, basically, in return. Yeah. So it's no longer like the Klondike gold days where they were rushing off to try and get their wooden bales and create their things. You know, we've got way better infrastructure now to do it, but completely hear your point. It makes yeah. total sense. So that was the real measuring stick that we applied. And uh, in my presentation that I'd done in 2018, it was talking about whether we will return back to a gold standard or use something like Bitcoin as the new measuring stick. Yeah. And that is what George really does start to hit on, the fact that we need to use Bitcoin as the new measuring stick for any form of money that we use. So, of course, countries and nation states, they, they can have their currencies attached to it, but this is what needs to be the new measuring stick that literally sets the status quo. Yeah, 100%. And I think, to be honest with you, that's a real nice um, tone and a real nice message to actually wrap this episode up now. Um, it's been a really enjoyable uh, three days actually covering over the event. Um, you and I were saying just this morning, it's been really enjoyable just to sit there and watch it, to be quite honest with you. Um, sometimes, you know, when you're, you're going to sit there and watch a conference that's on for, say, eight hours or whatever it is, you can kind of be like, oh, you know, there's certain people that I want to listen to, there's certain people that I don't want to listen to. But to be quite frank, the whole event from start to finish was outstanding. Really, really enjoyed it. And again, that's a testament to what CoinGeek do in terms of actually putting on these events um, and making it happen the way they happen. Yeah. So again, thank you for all the work that you guys do. Um, it's a really, really solid job from that point of view. Yeah. And... Uh, Calvin came on uh, near the end and was just talking about how, what the structure of the event actually was. Um, so, of course, unprecedented times, meaning that everything pretty much had to be virtual. They actually really liked the format. I really like the format. You, you get direct, for example, when we're at the event, yeah, you get all of the energy. You can go around to all the different booths and you can talk to people in person. So you get like different responses from people and you can share different information than what you would normally just type in online. Yep. But what the benefit was this time round is when we're there in person, we can't watch everything. It's impossible to actually watch all of the content that is, is floating about. Agreed, when yeah. you're watching everything online, it, it enables you to get a really good feel as to the general agenda to the whole event. No, I completely agree. It's not as if you can uh, grab out a remote control and pause Craig while he's talking and then just go off and, uh, and have a chat with someone and come back. So it's always that uh, beauty of having that opportunity to be able to pause. Like you said, I think the only uh, thing I think it could be seen as a slight drawback is the network networking aspects. But you know, CoinGeek again did a terrific job to be able yeah. to make sure that people could chat within the ecosystem that they created for the conference. Um, you know, they did a stellar, stellar job on yeah. that side of things. And I think they're going to well, Calvin said that they're going to be doing. Uh, they're going to integrate this into things when it, everything goes back to normal. So we'll have a hybrid model. Oh, exactly and perfect. So as always, guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of Crypto Time. My name's James Coughlin. This is Antonio Schillingford signing off from our Crypto Time live special on the actual CoinGeek event. Um, if you are enjoying the content that's been coming out from BitStocks at the moment, please hit that like, subscribe and notification button. And we also have a message from BitStocks. We have now added price alerts to the Gravity ecosystem. So if you are looking for a specific price, you can hit that number into the system and you will get a little alarm and email to notify you when that does happen. So head on over, check that out. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Bye for now. Peace and love.